Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Sean, and I'll see you later in the networking rooms. Now I'd like to welcome all of you to the Startup Nation segment. I'm joined on screen now by Nicolas Samios, co-founder and managing partner at PropTech One Ventures to discuss upcoming market trends related to the future of smart building buildings. Welcome, Nicolas. Hi there. Hi, great to have you on. Now, uh, before we go into the list of startups uh, we should, that we should keep an eye out for in this space and the two live pitches, I'd like to start off with you. Perhaps you can tell our audience at home a little bit about PropTech One Ventures and your role there. Absolutely, my pleasure. So we started PropTech One Ventures um, early 2018 as one of the first continental Europe funds purely focusing on PropTech and construction tech startups. So we are pretty stage agnostic, invest from seed stage to growth stage. Now I have done nine investments or have done more investments, but in nine portfolio companies pretty much across the spectrum. Um, so our thesis is that uh, for obvious reasons, um, everything around real estate will become more digital and also more sustainable. So which is kind of the second mega trend we're addressing. Um, and so basically we're trying to do a good job uh, as simple as that. So we assembled a team out of serial entrepreneurs, um, very senior real estate executives, um, venture capital guys, basically, which I'm one, one of them to support, find and support the best companies. That's it. Yeah, it is this common because I mean, there is some heat about, uh, well, there's some buzz around prop tech, but are there many funds that are so uh, focused on this scene? Well, basically, um, when we started, uh, pretty much Europe was um, not, there were not too many independent funds. So, so maybe the first corporate investors started to invest from the balance sheet. And, and usually this is, let's say, a little bit of playful try and error thing. And only few of them really develop a full corporate venture platform. What we basically saw back then is that in the United States, you had uh, the first true independent funds emerging like Fifth Wall or Brick and Mortar Ventures or Metaprop, these guys. Uh, but there was nothing really in Europe. So this is why we said simple enough. Yeah? So screw it, let's do it. And just tried it ourselves. Uh, it was also difficult to say beginning of 2018 how large the investment universe really is because there was no, no good data available. Um, so we just gave it a try and end of 2018, we said, okay, this sounds feasible. Yeah? So we, we have achieved like a proof of concept. So let's upgrade the structure, get in more LPs in, yeah, uh, do a larger team. We're also expanding our footprint across Europe right now. So hired the first analyst in London, for example, uh, early this year. Um, so I think it's, it's a good space to be in, uh, but it's still kind of in the first inning, yeah, to say so. Yeah. But so what does the European market currently look like? And does it really differ from, for example, the US that might have been a bit uh, further ahead on this in terms of investment? Um, so, of course, when you talk about venture capital, of course, at private equity and equity in general, the yeah, United States is ahead of the curve compared to Europe. Um, so that's, that's obvious. Um, still, um, if you are doing a traditional venture capital fund, so whatever, uh, marketplace, e-commerce, ad tech, doesn't matter, um, you always look into the Silicon Valley area and say, okay, so they're setting the trend. And then after some years, you see the same stuff happening in Europe. I think in prop tech, construction tech, it's a bit different. Um, a lot of new standards are emerging out of Europe. So if you just think about energy efficiency, that's just one topic. This, this for obvious reasons, is nothing that really had a home in the United States. Maybe it's now changing with the Biden administration, and that could also be a great opportunity for European startups, by the way. But a lot of standards about whatever, construction safety and, and stuff are really emerging out of Europe. So this is why I think, especially for prop tech and construction tech startups, um, Europe is a good place to be. Um, uh, and, and, and so we don't need to just always look into whatever, Asian markets or yes markets. Uh, I think we can be proud on what's happening here. That's really interesting because in many aspects of technology, Europe is often seen as more of a regulator than the innovator. But do you feel like in the prop tech space that this kind of regulatory focus is actually the drive for innovation, the drive for standards and new uh, ways of doing things? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, so. So you can you can say you can speak of regulation as something. Um, something that slows innovation down yeah but you can also look at it the other way around if you solve european regulation kind of you're ready to go worldwide more or less and also there is let's say a market for emerging regulation so think about the green new deal so von der Leyen's um 
big, big, big check. Yeah, she writes to uh, cool, innovative companies that, for example, do um, energy efficiency modernization in a scalable way. Just an example. If you solve that, so if you if you match that kind of new regulation, um, you can go international with that because other countries will follow. Yeah, other countries and other regions will have similar programs. So this is this is why I think um, it, it's not always kind of black and white, and it's not too bad to be in a regulated environment. Yeah. So if you if you do it here, you, you can do it everywhere. And so what are the trends that you're currently seeing? Because I mean, you started in 2018, but that feels like a, <laughs> a hundred years in prop tech, seeing how we've changed our interactions with buildings in that time. But so is it mostly about energy efficiency or are there other aspects that you're seeing kind of rise in the last few months? So there are definitely many sectors we are interested in, and we also really believe that there are big business opportunities as a starter. So there is a sector we call kind of the IT basics or IT spring cleaning or whatsoever. So still, if you look at, for example, how large asset managers that, that have like 50 billion real estate assets manage their portfolios, it's just an IT and process nightmare. Yeah. So at the end of the day, they need to do an Excel sheet to, to make a decision for something. Yeah, but, but that's that, that's crap. So the status quo there is still um, so low yeah, that, that a clever startup that develops a proper process IT solution, I'm not even speaking of artificial intelligence, so then this is something you can put on top, but that helps these asset managers, for example, to digitize their floor plans, digitize all the contracts, and then do something with that. So this is this is something that has high season. Of course, also, because of Corona, yeah. So if you're not longer working in the office, you don't have access to physical files. So you need to have kind of cloud-based storage systems and process systems. So this is still an area where a lot of money can be made. Yeah. Of course, you have the energy efficiency part. So so we already mentioned that. Of course, you have the kind of IoT smart building space. Yeah. But but I'm always keen. So don't forget these basics. Yeah. So we're also still in the kind of first inning of digitization. So a lot of homework still has to be done or to put it the other way around. It's still a very good business opportunity for clever startups to connect with the industry and just help them improving their basic process, their efficiencies. Because I think there is no industry uh, like real estate that is kind of has never been optimized yeah, from within. So a lot of other industries, uh, for example, private equity guys have, have started to attack them 20 years ago. And this is not just starting in real estate. So it was so easy to earn decent money in real estate, to put it in, 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 in these terms, um, that people just didn't need to optimize the process. Yeah, but this, this might change right now. But so is the folk, are, are the bigger trends than within the B2B rather than in uh, people's homes, for example? So do you foresee that the solutions that are uh, the most promising are for these kind of bigger scale projects? I would say so, yeah. So generally speaking, let's say two thirds of the companies or maybe even three quarters are B2B oriented because it might be that the tenant has a user interface to something, but at the end of the day, it's a commercial enterprise that sets up the systems kind of, yeah, that owns whatever, 20,000 20, residential units. So even if you have a consumer facing front end, you're still selling to a corporate customer. And so this is also something where I think it makes big sense to have some specialized investors in the ecosystem, because the traditional, let's say, lazy mainstream internet VC still believes that uh, scaling up your business means just buying more ads on Google or on Facebook. And that, of course, is not true for most of the prop tech startups. So it's hard B2B sales process. So it can be whatever, a lead time of one, two years. Yeah, so that's easily uh, possible. So you need to understand that. And of course, as an investor, uh, you need to be a little bit patient here and there. Uh, but of course, you also need to help your startups maybe in kind of accelerating yeah, these, these sales projects, um, connecting them to the right um, kind of buyers in the industry. Also, for example, helping them now with um, getting critical mass so that a corporate procurement um, officer can uh, yeah, buy something from a small startup yeah, because that's also a risk for him if he buys an innovative solution. So a lot of things out of, let's say, the enterprise class B2B sales handbook yeah, have to be applied more than the B2C um, uh, handbook. Yeah, and I guess it, it really makes sense to have this kind of focused fund in this space since, as you mentioned, the lead time can be a bit longer and the, there seems to be a bigger need for someone in between the startup and the bigger enterprise clients. But 
um, that kind of brings us to the startups to watch list that you gathered for us. Now we'll have two startups later on to give us a quick pitch of their solutions. But if we get up the slide now with the list of companies, uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit about Simplify and why you uh, chose them as kind of a startup to watch in this scene. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think the first, first good message is that these are six startups out of maybe a hundred or something that we have on the database. So we're really speaking about a rich ecosystem right now. So it's not just like two or three. Uh, Simplify, uh, what they're doing is they are doing, uh, they're digitizing lift management elevators uh, because lifts elevators are pain points in any type of real estate. So they, they are expensive, they break down, uh, you have kind of a asymmetric um, situation. So the, the, the people operating the real estate don't know the technical details. So the technical support companies can charge whatever they want, very simplified, uh, if an elevator breaks down. So Simplify digitizes the whole process and kind of helps the landlords um, operate large portfolios. And um, they also have an IoT component, but it's not just IoT. It's also part is document management, document management systems and kind of optimizing the supply relationships. Yeah, that's actually uh, something one. I never, uh, sorry, uh, but just a bit more on Simplify, I had never really realized uh, how much of a pain point elevators can be. It was also mentioned in the round table earlier on, but so is Simplify, um, like, so it's just digitizing the services around it rather than implementing a specific IoT within the elevators to monitor it? It, they, they, they do both. The starting point is okay. basically that they take over the relationship between the landlord and the elevator service companies kind of and optimize that. And they're doing that in a data-driven approach. So they are gathering all data they can get either from documents, but they're also, for example, doing like 360 degrees photos from the elevator inside because no elevator is done the same as another elevator. It's a big puzzle of different components. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they can also put an IoT component on top of old elevators, which is especially interesting because you will never have only the latest generation IoT digital ready elevators yeah, from any vendor. You always have a portfolio and the majority of the elevators is from the 50s, from the 60s or something. Yeah? So doing uh, kind of integrating that everything creates, creates a value and, and simplified uh, the, the, uh, the landlords have whatever 20, 30% less cost on the elevators, um, they have less downtime. So also the, the tenants are more happy, of course. Um, so it's a win-win for everybody. Interesting. Now let's uh, move on to Villisto. So what was it about them that kind of uh, got you excited? So Villisto is about energy efficiency. So the big, the big topic this year, I guess, with the EU taxonomy. And what Villisto is doing is like, let's say it's a B2B version of Tado. So, so I think most of you will know Tado. So a, a smart uh, a thermostat you put on an old radiator. Yeah? You might have a cool fence in your building where everything is connected already. So then you need another solution. But uh, real estate is mainly not building new real estate. It's about whatever, 98% of the business is managing existing real estate. So we have a lot of legacy issues. So Velisto has this small smart, start solution, uh, smart solution that you can put on any old radiator. It's whatever, 100 euros per unit. And um, the system analyzes um, while you're um, kind of listening to the room, um, if there is somebody present or not. If somebody is not present, they basically yeah, turn down the heat and then learn with, with an AI system that whatever, every morning at eight o'clock, for example, people come to the office. So they need to start heating up again at seven o'clock or something so that they reach the right temperature level. And so with, with some learning curves, these systems optimize, they're also connected to a weather forecast, stuff like that. And so you can, uh, for a very small uh, kind of uh, investment, you can upgrade any, any type of existing building and save whatever 20%, 30 percent of the heating cost. So I think that's of course a cool solution. It saves money, and it's of course also uh, a good thing um, ecologically. Yeah, it sounds like a perfect uh, continuation of the smart thermostat. So instead of determining it beforehand, guessing your needs, it will just basically look at how you're using it and adapt accordingly. So now the next startup I'm guessing is a play on Edifice, but I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Edifion. Um, Edifion, I would say, but, but okay. good question is also, let's, I, I would say Edifion. So, so we're now going, let's say, kind of to the next larger system. Yeah. So uh, the Lister is something you can use in any small residential or office, uh, so it doesn't matter. Edifion is a system that goes to kind of larger buildings where you have 
uh, centralized um, heating uh, systems, um, air conditioning systems whatsoever. And these systems generate data. And so the starting point for any optimization is to get the data on a platform. So think about like Google Analytics yeah, for um, systems in buildings. Yeah? So attaching to as many um, kind of silos that you will find, getting the data in, normalizing it, putting it on a portal, um, enriching it with external data, data sources so that you can start to do something with it. And the more systems you have in any, any piece of real estate, of course, the more important is this kind of analytics layer on top. And so I think okay. they are one of, the, one of the best companies in that space. Interesting. Now we have to go on to the pitches real quick, but we have R8 tech left. So maybe you could just give us a simple sentence on what that solution is. So they are again, kind of the next larger cluster. So if you have a building management system in a, in a real estate, so that's the case for let's say 20% of the larger commercial real estates, think of a shopping mall, R8 connects to that and optimizes how the building management system runs the real estate, again, saving energy. That's great. Now, we actually have Thingit and District Technologies here as, with us today, so we'll let them explain what they're about. Each will be introducing us to their te technology in a three-minute pitch, and then take some questions from the audience. And I'm also going to ask you to ask them questions, Nicholas. Uh, but so, for the audience, remember to add at Q&A in your comments on the chat. We'll begin with Dr. Mark Guy Seperi, founder and CEO of Think Technologies. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Gillespie. I'm the founder and CEO of Think Technologies. And today I'm introducing our enterprise digital building system, uh, Thingit. So Thingit deals with, um, with all holders of large portfolios of buildings. That is specifically the corporate real estate manager, the asset manager and developer, which develops for others or for, for their own portfolio and facilities managers um, providing services. So they all uh, are facing challenges. The corporate real estate manager needs to save costs. That means lease uh, needs to improve employee efficiency, comfort, uh, health, security, et cetera. The asset manager, Nico mentioned that before, is, is really driven by their investors and their tenants uh, for ESG compliance, want to provide digital readiness for clients. The facilities manager needs to offer new services, uh, cheaper services, uh, needs to avoid the need for skilled personnel. So they all have figured out that um, they might address um, the challenges with building digitalization or even more so uh, they found out it's imperative to do so, but they're scared of point solutions. They are scared of bespoke projects across the portfolio. In other words, they're looking for a scalable enterprise level mean to address their digitalization needs. And that is what thing it is. Thing it is um, one platform, one deployment in the portfolio <coughs> for all respective stakeholders and provides you with um, virtually an infinite uh, number of use cases from the different uh, portfolio holder perspectives. I would like to explain this in a little example. Uh, let's look at Sylvia. Sylvia is a corporate real estate manager. She wants to roll out uh, digitalization across her portfolio of uh, corporate sites and she has already identified um, a multitude of use cases such as desk booking, access control, <coughs> parking support, etc. Uh, with deploying Thingit, she gets um, a rich app for all stakeholders um, and uh, supporting the various use cases. She gets a management portal for dashboarding and monitoring specifically uh, for things like our COVID prevention work, but also other aspects like energy or sus sustainability measures and reporting. And Finally, she gets other digitalization components such as welcome screens, room panels, and so forth. And all that connected <coughs> to the largest number of third-party uh, hardware technologies um, from buildings within the buildings in the industry. So all we have to gain for, uh, for Sylvia 
Uh, Sylvia obviously can uh, reduce uh, the space in the next uh, lease renewal. She has improved comfort efficiency for their uh, for her employees. At the same time, uh, Daniel, who is an asset manager, maybe the landlord uh, for Sylvia, one of the premises uh, Sylvia is using, uh, he gets uh, ESG transparency across the entire portfolio at the same time, and with the same investment supports the digital readiness, which in turn uh, Sylvia needs. This is not a vision, this is not the future, this is what we are doing now, and we do this uh, from landmark buildings like Cube Berlin, the most intelligent office building um, in Europe over city quarters like Katiadestrasse in Berlin or corporate sites, like all the Zalando offices. Um, and we do this with the largest number of live digitalization use cases and live connectors to uh, technologies within the building. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Unfortunately, I don't think we saw your slides there, but hopefully we can kind of clear it up with the questions now. So let's start with uh, Nicholas. So do you have a question regarding, uh, yeah, based on Mark's uh, presentation? Yeah, I think if, if I understand correctly, Mark, so you are kind of, let's say, a middleware layer that connects everything with everything. Is that the kind of the USP you would consider uh, okay. for yourselves? Absolutely, it's, it's the richness of the middleware layer which which supports the use case cases. But what people don't want to do, they don't want to use a middleware layer, an IoT platform, or what have you, um, to implement their own use case. What they want is they want a powerful middleware layer, but they also want out of the box support for their use case. They don't want to implement their own apps. They want an app which can do desk booking. They want a dashboard which can do ESG transparency monitoring. Uh, and reporting and so forth. So we provide both pretty much like an operating system provides the operating system connectivity to the hardware and then also uh, uh, software programs like like uh, um, like GarageBand um, or iMovie uh, out of the box for the use cases. All right, so we uh, can put a few of the slides up on the screen now, I think, but we also have an incoming question from the audience, but just to, yeah, but we can still get the slides a bit so we can see them. Yeah. So that's the last example you were talking about there about this uh, interactions between tenant and the landlord. Um, is there anything on that slide that we might have missed in your presentation just so now that we have it on the screen? No, this is just the, the use cases Sylvia wants to address. And, and really from our experience in the market, the larger corporations all have this broad bandwidth of use cases in mind and they uh, they already know that they want to support that in the field it's just not it's it's not that they they just want to support just one of them or so they, they already come with three four five and they know that tomorrow they have another five uh, they need to support so they want to rely on something they invest once into a platform which can scale with their requirements all right thank you very much mark uh now we'll hand it over to lee put founder and CEO of District Technologies. The floor is yours, Lee. Hi everyone, my name is Lee. I'm the co-founder and CEO of District Technologies and I hope that you can see my slides as I switch. Yes, perfect. So we are a platform similar to Thingit, but very different in terms of what we focus on, which is user experience and design. So we work with some of the biggest landlords, companies, and property managers to help them connect their office space um, with employees uh, that work for them, shared spaces, services, and what they love. And we have a fantastic team. My background is in building large co-working spaces. So I set up a big one in Berlin and then London, sort of was on the operating side of buildings before starting uh, this tech business with Pete, who's my co-founder and CTO. And he had a previous smart city tech sensor company. So very much you know, connected to smart city um, space that he sold in 2012. We have some fantastic advisors and um, investors on board. So I think it's clear, we don't need to tell you, I think you've had a lot of talks about how hybrid working is here to stay. 
COVID has forced even the most traditional companies to adopt remote working. And uh, you know, more than 80% are confirming that this will not go anywhere and they will continue to allow people to work flexibly at least a few times a week. So if you do think of the office as an agile space, you need to book um, those agile spaces. And big companies often have a multitude of applications to book different things or do different things in your day to day. And we essentially replace that with one extremely easy to use, user friendly office platform or workplace platform for our clients to engage their community, connect amenities and services, and drive actionable insights through real time analytics. This is what it looks like on a high level. We have more than 15 core features and more than 10 integrations. We don't believe in integrating everything under the sun. It should only be valuable to the client and the end user experience if you do want to have an integration with smart building tech, for example. So we have lots of case studies of brilliant global businesses that have adopted our technology and expanded. Um, we're live with WPP in more than four of these huge campuses, and they're rolling out to 170,000 employees globally, 21 campuses. We also work with some large landlords like Merlin Properties in Spain. We even translated the app for them into Spanish. So these are fully branded apps where it really feels like it's the client's own technology, but we, we publish it and maintain it for them in their own Apple stores. Um, like I said, we work with some of the best clients globally, Starwood, GWLRA, Cushman, Wakefield. We're live in over 86 buildings, and we're rolling out to more than 150 more, um, also expanding across to different countries. And yeah, if you're interested in finding out more, look us up, districtmindstech.com, and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Lee. Now let's start with another question from you, Nicholas. What did you think of when you saw their presentation right now? I think I think it's it's a compelling mix of use cases. And my question would be: Is there like one killer use case that really drives adoption, or is it really the total experience uh, that makes it compelling for for users and also the, the landlords? Yeah, great question. I think definitely. Today, it's the COVID safety aspect. We're getting a lot of new clients sign up with us who are looking at transitioning to a hybrid way of working post lockdown. So if you're working at home right now, you know, have you managed your employee experience to go to enable them to go back to the office in an ideal way and to make their your employees feel very safe as well. So now you can set a capacity, you can book yourself back into the office, you get a COVID survey with symptoms. And only when you've signed that are you able to actually work in the office a couple of days a week um, or like on demand as you wish. And also a lot of our community features are very key. I think, you know, it's not just about the space management, but it's about connecting with people, whether you work at home or in the office and finding um, colleagues that you might need for certain projects, especially in larger companies with a couple hundred or a couple thousands of employees. You can imagine it can become quite you know, daunting and lonely at home if you're working at home for too long. Yeah, we, but we also got a question from the audience. So now the 50% adoption from users is really good, but how do you intend to drive this upwards? Where, how can you get closer to the users? Yeah, so our platform is a community and smart building platform. So we always say on the on the one hand, you can launch an office platform, an office portfolio or buildings with us with just using the community features. And that for that 50% is very high. So you may join events, you may connect with other people in your company, all the knowledge and productivity spillover effects of like working in a co-working for your own office. And then if you add functionality like access control or smart building integrations. Um, if, you, if you force your employees to book themselves back into the office and fill out the COVID survey before going back, you'll see the adoption drive to 80, 90%. But it's really about the operations of how you operate your office will also drive adoption of a technology like this. 
Yeah, it sounds really interesting. But I'm afraid that's all the time we have for now. Thank you once again, Nicholas, Mark, and Lee for being with us here today. We'll be back in one second for the final segment. We've seen some amazing sessions today, and I honestly could have listened to them tell their stories all day. But all th good things must come to an end. However, we're not done yet. We've got the networking rooms coming up. But before we meet up there, I'd like to thank all of our speakers who joined us here today. I'd like to remind you that the next event in the Rise Spotlight series will be on April 13th. The theme for the next event will be digital signage. We touched on that a bit here earlier, so make sure not to miss it. You can register right now with a link provided in the chat, so get to it. Also, please keep an eye on your inbox as you'll soon receive an email with details of other small smart building related content, including Avixa Power Hours and the Cedia podcast, as well as the slides from Sean Wargo's presentation. But now let's go on to today's networking rooms. You've got two wonderful sessions to choose from, which you can find in the sessions area on the left side of your screen. The first room is Smart Buildings and Pro AV with Sean Wargo, you saw him here earlier, and Bob Snyder. There you'll take a deeper dive into Avix's IOTA statistics and uncover some important trends within the smart building industry. The second room you can choose from is KNX in the Home with Ed Wenk and Pip Evans. This CDA run session looks at how the KNX protocol can be used as the backbone of smart home installation. You can also choose to join the networking area to be automatically matched with another participant for a five minute one-on-one -on -one meeting. So to sum up, all you gotta do now is three things. Choose the room for you, ask a question and have fun. I'll see you there in just a few moments.